so uh, it is absolutely fascinating. But you can see why this is so strategic. The year is 1689 and we are standing on the Braes of Killiecrankie. The day started with General Hugh Mackay, who led the gov Scottish Government force, leaving Dunkeld early in the morning and marching up through the Pass of Killiecrankie. <clears throat> Today you can see it simplified. If you look at the White House down there to the right, and you can see the modern A9 up on the left, the Pass of Killiecrankie was sort of between the two. This was the only route into the Highlands. The two armies were the Jacobites from the, coming from the north, the Scottish Government Army coming from the south. Both of them really interested in the strategically important Blair Castle. We're using the uh, investigation carried out by Dr. Tony Pollard and Neil Oliver in 2003. You can see very clearly here the line of the A9 and the rough positions of the Government Army and the Jacobite force. We're currently standing here, just to the right of Ochel Moor, looking down towards the A9. So we're on the extreme left wing of the Jacobite force, who were facing the right wing of the government force below them. We've got to the position where the two armies have, are, are broadly in position where the fight will take place, where the battle will take place. Now, just to give you an idea, the government, Scottish government army was made up primarily of Scots-Dutch regiments. And the numbers vary to some extent, but between four and 5,000 government troops had marched through the Pass of Killiecrankie with 1,200 pack horses or, or donkeys bringing their gear. The Highlanders had marched from Blair, uh, from Blair Athol, as I said, and they arrived here with between two and two and a half thousand men. They then occupied this position. The two armies then stood facing each other for over two hours. The two armies had very different tactics. The Scots Dutch regiments were briefed and versed in all the latest tactics coming from Europe, and it was a very ponderous affair on their side. They moved to the sound of the drum beat. The Highlanders, on the other hand, were completely different. They fought in their clan regiments. They, pr they valued the prowess of the Highland warrior. Uh, the, they were led by the, the Dunja Ursula, the gentlemen of the clan who were the best armed, leading from the front. They will have advanced down towards the government troops very aggressively and <clears throat> stood waiting for the final order to charge, probably 200 to 250 yards from the government line. This battle uh, signifies the first time we know that volley fire by platoon was uh, conducted. So we know from General Hugh Mackay's account that this occurred. We know uh, with almost great certainty this is the last recorded use of the two-handed uh, broadsword used by Highlanders. The two-handed sword of William Wallace fame was used here. We know that this was the first recorded use of grenades. I cannot overemphasize the importance and significance of this battle, not only in terms of tactics and the evolve, evolution from the old to the modern, but also in terms of the Jacobite uh, wars that followed. This was the first battle of the Jacobite wars, which ended so tragically for the Jac Jacobites at Culloden in 1746. So this spans an epoch change in, in our culture and our history that we really should recognize and understand better. We're now standing in this, roughly in this position here. So we're now standing closer towards the center of the Jacobite force. More recently, the, the Scottish government has decided, rightly in our opinion, that the A9 needs to be uh, broadened, it needs to be extended into a dual carriageway. What we cannot understand is, despite the extra knowledge we have about the archaeology, they have chosen to put the additional carri carriageway on the downhill side where the most intense fighting took place. The, the battle itself uh, took place right on, just on the other side of the A9. Now this road was built in the early 80s, late 70s, the development started. At that time in history, no account whatsoever was taken about the battlefield. Very little was known about the battlefield, uh, and certainly it wasn't a major consideration. However, in, term, in 2003, uh, Dr. Tony Pollard and Neil Oliver of Glasgow University came here with the now famous Two Men in a Trench series. They carried out a serious archaeological investigation into this battlefield. So we know the archaeology is important. We know that the archaeology is a developing field. 
The ground where the fighting took place, just over the A9, is also potentially the ground where the people were buried. We know Cameron of Loch Hill with his men came back to view the work after the battle took place. And the bodies were heaped on that ground just through the trees there. They were astounded, the Highlanders were astounded and shocked by their own handiwork. We cannot understand why the proposal is to put the carriageway right on the ground where the most intensive fighting took place, where all those people were killed, where the battle turned on the topography and understanding how they moved in those last few seconds before the, the two armies clashed hand to hand. If they put the carriageway on the north side, we accept it would still go through the battlefield, but far, through far less important ground than where they're currently proposing to place it. We're standing approximately here, looking down towards the underpass going through the A9, which is roughly here somewhere. And just immediately to my left here is a field that the archaeology has been, was totally destroyed when the first A9 was put through. We know that because the two men in the trench found nothing here. They subsequently discovered this is where the, the vehicles were parked. The question we have is, this substantial piece of ground, the archaeology has already been destroyed. Why are we insisting, why is Transport Scotland insisting on putting the new road, the new extension, on the other side? Why not use this side? We're standing at the memorial can uh, with Urad, Urad House to our right. This is, this is in the middle of the marshy ground that General Mackay refers to in his account. So we're standing here in front of the memorial cairn, which is used every year to commemorate this famous battle. Later this year, on January the 16th, a public inquiry ordered by the Scottish Government is going to take place. For this inquiry, uh, a reporter has been appointed who will adjudicate between the two sides. I think it's really important to, to recognise, however, that this is not a fair contest. We as the people of Killiecrankie, people who are interested in the, the battle itself, have our own limited resources, whereas the Scottish Government, Transport Scotland, seem to have banks of lawyers. Every time I've been to this field with them, they always outnumber us, probably two or three to one. So it's a little bit like the replay of the original battle, with the Scottish Government heavily outnumbering the people on the other side. If you're interested in this, and if you're interested in helping us preserve Scottish history, then that you petition the, our politicians, this is a Scottish Government matter, I would ask you to petition the First Minister herself. The decision that will be made about this battlefield is a political decision, it's a decision that will be made by the Scottish Government, and they are in the position to preserve the, the, this area for future generations, and they are susceptible to public opinion. So please, if you are interested in this, send your emails to Nicola Sturgeon, ask her to change this decision.